I suppose that's a kind of fear that I have is that if you look back to about 2004-ish when probiotics were the next big thing and everybody was quite excited about them they didn't really do it and so now it's almost poisoned the word and people are not as interested in it anymore you know and of course the reason for that is that the the organisms that were chosen were chosen for convenience purpose and not for specific indication or to fulfill a niche or to achieve a particular microbial effect right. it was just oh we can we can put this in a yogurt and keep it in the fridge um, let's see what it does to IBD you know so no surprise then that they're not very effective <laughs> And perhaps for you or I, if we go to a barbecue and we eat an a undercooked chicken sandwich and we end up with Campylobacter and we spend five days in the toilet and we're not very well, we've gone into dysbiosis, um, but we then come out of it again. So it's like an unstable dysbiosis where your, your body can write that and fix that problem. The following is a conversation with Dr. Richard Hansen, consultant, pediatric gastroenterologist, the Royal Hospital for Children in Glasgow, an honorary associate clinical professor at the University of Glasgow. Dr. Hansen's main research interests are related to that within the gut microbiome. He has pioneered the application of novel dietary methods to children suffering from Crohn's disease as part of a study called CD Treat, and has also been involved in the application of faecal microbiota transplantation, also known as intestinal microbiota transfer, to paediatric populations with inflammatory bowel disease. This is Inside Matters. My name is Dr. James McElroy. I hope you enjoy it. We am, I'm going to go to the Glasgow University Microbiome Group. Yeah. Sort of Gum, Gummy. The gummy. The gummy bear. what it's called, yeah. <laughs> gummy. And that'll be a great opportunity to see yeah. everyone face to face. And also we can present some of the work that we're doing at Enterobiotics. Yeah. Uh, GRI are the lead site um, for our clinical study in patients with cirrhosis and HE. So there's a close link there. Good. What I'd be keen to explore though is, can we do more in the way of analytical toolkit? Can we do more in the way of studies? Yeah. And if so, what's the next indication? I mean, you mentioned UC and we're going to talk a yeah. lot about UC and IBD, but... There must be a lot more expertise and capability in in Glasgow, right, to to do work in different areas. Yeah, I'm I'm confident there is. I mean, it just depends on what, what area you want to enter. I mean, I'm clearly not. You know, I, I, my expertise is narrowed to IBD and probably within that pediatric IBD. But um, there's interest in microbiome science probably across all of medicine now. Do you know? Um, right from obesity, cardiovascular disease, cancer, um, altering cancer response to therapy, maybe even. Um, so th there's lots of places that um, you, could, you could look to test the product. But um, and that, how's that it, changed over it, the last, just say, five years in terms of the potential indications in patient populations that microbiome therapy can benefit? Yeah, I, I think... Uh, I think probably what's happened is we've seen a um, an explosion of interest in microbiome because it, it's easier and easier to test for it within laboratory science. And so you've seen lots more groups get interested in that and the more associations with the microbiome. But probably I still feel, you know, 10, 12, 15, however many years you count it, depending on when you start at the beginning of what microbiome, clinical microbiome science was, um, I probably still feel that microbiome therapy or microbial therapeutics is is just getting started is mm. it in its infancy. Right, you know? right. Um, so I think there'll be lots of indications, but I think along the way there'll also be lots of paths that don't lead anywhere where people will trial something and it doesn't work out. And I suppose that's a kind of fear that I have is that if you look back to about 2004-ish when probiotics were the next big thing, and everybody was quite excited about them. They didn't really do it. And so now it's almost poisoned the word and people are not as interested in it anymore, you know. And of course, the reason for that is that the the organisms that were chosen were chosen for convenience purpose and not for specific indication or to fulfill a niche or to achieve a particular microbial effect. Right. It was just, oh, we can, we can put this in a yogurt and keep it in the fridge. 
um, let's see what it does to IBD. You know, so no surprise then that they're not very effective. <laughs> we can scale this up in a huge fermenter and yeah, it's easy yeah. to... So when did you start to get interested in the microbiome? Um, it's about 2004. <laughs> there was did you this, take a probiotic? Uh, and uh, I right. didn't take a probiotic, <laughs> but, but I suppose what I'm saying is um, it, coming into that, you know, I, I suppose I was... I came out of medical school interested in paediatrics and then along the way I fell into paediatric gastroenterology and got interested in that as a specialty and I suppose became quite passionate about looking after patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And I, I was very aware that we were using exclusive enteral nutrition to, to treat inflammatory bowel disease, but probably at that point, and we're probably talking around 2005-ish, I don't think people were fully aware of how that did its job, how it worked. Um, what and was I, the, sorry to cut you off, but what was the genesis of EEN? Actually, sorry, what is EEN? Yeah, so we should probably start there. Yeah. So EEN is exclusive enteral nutrition, and it describes a usually six to eight week uh, therapy course of a liquid only diet. Um, so with no other solid food uh, that we treat patients with Crohn's disease. Um, and through taking that, we can drive... Uh, the majority of them actually into clinical remission. So the data probably suggests about four out of five patients, wow. paediatric patients can go into clinical remission with exclusive enteral nutrition if they take that alone for six to eight weeks. Wow. Um, so that that's a kind of, that's, it was first sort of arrived in paediatrics in the sort of 1970s, but has kind of steadily increased in popularity and use as a therapy from the sort of 90s onwards. And it's now, accepted as a mainstay of our therapeutic arsenal and it's probably the the first line induction treatment for pediatric Crohn's disease. Wow. It's, al it's also becoming much more popular in adult Crohn's disease now, um, although it, it is a therapy that's very cumbersome. You know, if I asked you to just take a liquid-only diet for eight weeks, given all the social aspects of life, your friend asks you to go out for a meal, you know, or you want to have a drink or something like that, then no, that's that's off. You are on your milkshakes, you know. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, it's snacks tough. every day for for and we make people do it for eight weeks rather than six weeks because probably the longer you take the course, the more effective it is. Um, so we'll we'll come back to EEN and what people drink to make sure they get the right nutrition and how it's working and so on. But can we just go back a step further and talk about IBD and what yeah. what, what yeah. IBD is and can start wherever you like. Yeah, let's do that. Let, let, let's go back to the fundamental. Yep. So I, IBD. So uh, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, basically describes a chronic, by which I mean long-term uh, condition of inflammation within the gut. There's two main types of IBD. There's Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and they're both slightly different, and we'll become on that in a second. But I suppose if you're thinking about it, what's inflammation within the gut, well, if you had a spot on your nose, it's red, it's tender, it's sore, you can see that there's inflammation there. And in IBD, you have a similar amount of inflammation but around the gut in different places. And where that is impacts on what the symptoms are of the person who has that condition. And for reasons we don't fully understand, when you get IBD, that's then part of your journey forever in the same way that when you get epilepsy or diabetes or whatever, that that label is associated with you forever. So currently, uh, and, I, and I need to lean on Billy Connolly here, um, so Billy Connolly, <laughs> when he was given a Parkinson's diagnosis, his doctor said to him, there's no cure. And he said, that's a terrible thing to say to people. And don't say that because it takes hope away. It's better to say there's no cure yet or we're still working on a cure. And that's the case with IBD. You know, right. we, we, we're, there's a lot of research, a lot of interest in IBD, what causes it, how we might treat it. But right now in 2022, if we give someone a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, we're giving them that for the rest of their life. And we're saying this is a part of you and your journey. And um, we have lots of good treatments for IBD to, to drive the disease into what we call remission, which is where we switch off that inflammation, the gut heals, the symptoms go away, um, but we don't have any curative therapies. Okay, so understood. So that inflammation, so in, in Crohn's disease, that inflammation can be any part of the gut from the mouth down to the bottom and can skip areas where there's healthy and then unhealthy throughout. Sometimes that can cause narrowing of the bowel. Sometimes it can cause abnormal connections between parts of the bowel. Ulcerative colitis, on the other hand, just affects the last part of the gut, the colon. Okay, uh, this this symptoms are affected by, or, or the symptoms are influenced by where the inflammation is in the gut. 
So the, if you've got inflammation in the last part of your gut, it tends to cause diarrhea, blood in the stools. Higher up, it might cause abdominal pain because it's your gut and it's got a job to do and that inflammation is around there and getting in the way and also it speeds up things going through. Sometimes it can lead to malnutrition, um, weight loss, uh, loss of energy. In, in my population in paediatrics, uh, delay in puberty, delays in cro- growth and things like that. So it's pretty significant and serious uh, conditions. Um, you mentioned paediatrics. Why do you think people are getting it earlier in life and some people are getting it later in life? Is what's driving that, do you think? So it's a really great question. And um, so we're definitely seeing more inflammatory bowel disease year on year than we were seeing before. And every time everyone who looks, anyone looks at that in the West, they're able to kind of describe that their curve is increasing generally. Um, but we're also seeing in pediatrics, we're seeing it getting younger. Um, so it's affecting patients who are younger. When I started doing this, it tended to be teenagers who came through the door. Increasingly, it's kids who are in the primary school ages. And, and really, yeah, and, and me. E- even more than that, we're seeing more and more children who are under five coming in with inflammatory bowel disease. So it's not now. It used to be wow. when I started my career, it's not that long ago. Wow, it was really rare to see somebody who was under five with inflammatory bowel disease, and now right. we have a, we have a small cohort of them, and and it's not unusual to see a wow. new one every year. Um, I, mean, I can't remember that much from my medical school days, but I can remember, you know, late teens, early adulthood, sometimes yeah. early yeah. teens is when yeah. people would first be diagnosed. I'd never heard of yeah. less than five. No, so it's changing a it's lot. It's incredible. And, um, well, and what, why is that? So why is that? Yeah. Great question. So it, our genetics hasn't changed over that time. Um, our epigenetics, which is about how our genes are switched on and switched off through processes that can influence them um, can might have changed a little bit over that time. Um, and those two might influence how our immune system works and how our immune system recognizes the bacteria that are in the gut. Um, probably year on year, the bacteria and that are in our gut are changing. So I suppose if you compare somebody who, who lives in a more traditional lifestyle in, in Africa with, against someone who lives in the West, you'll probably see they've got fewer bacterial species within their gut what we call the West. Back, uh, in the West, yeah. So what we'd call bacterial diversity. Um, and that's probably linked to the changes in our dietary patterns over many decades. So our food sources have become less complex, uh, more convenient, uh, probably less orientated towards fruits and vegetables, uh, more towards, um, oh, I forgot the word for this now the non-digestible uh, carbohydrates so yeah yeah non-digestible so we're not getting enough fiber yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. so so our, our our whole our whole way of eating as a species has shifted um and probably our ways of being associated with each other and being connected to each other as a community have shifted our exposure to antibiotics has changed we're delivering more babies by cesarean section so lots of things within society not all not any of these is individually causative but lots of things have changed for us as a species over the last 100 150 200 years that have fundamentally transformed our biology and how we are colonized by bacteria and how we interact with those bacteria. And that's probably set up the the right conditions for inflammatory bowel disease to happen in particular individuals. There will still be people who will get through all that and live through a whole life and never get inflammatory bowel disease. Um, but there are people who, who, for some reason, the setup of their genetics, their immune system, they are probably their, their baseline bacterial. There's very limited data on this. And then something comes along and, and sets them off. And trigger, and I, triggers it. Yeah, I call that the Humpty Dumpty conundrum because that's when <laughs> once he falls off the wall, you can't put him back together again the same way ever again. Um, but, Interesting. but based on doing that, you then drive yourself into inflammatory bowel disease. That might be a course of antibiotics. That might be an infection with a Campylobacter or a Salmonella. That might be you've gone to Tunisia on holiday. And anecdotally, you've heard all of these things come to you in clinic where he was fine and then he did this and then this happened. But similarly, again, I would reiterate, lots of people go to Tunisia or have antibiotics or have an infection. And they they don't it. get IBD. And they don't get IBD. So, so that's the part that's difficult for us to explain. Super interesting. Some of the triggers you just described there are also similar triggers to people that have psoriasis, for example, and, and they start to see the plaques for the first time. So maybe there's just something to do with the interaction between the microbiome and the immune system that's triggered by something. And in some people that produce a problem in their gut, in others it produces a problem with the skin based on probably their genetics. Yeah. So it's all about setting up your immune system to respond in an appropriate way to something, whether that's your own tissue and your kind of proper autoimmune process where you're recognizing your own cells are foreign 
or recognizing something that's supposed to be tolerated like the bacteria in your gut and recognizing that as foreign and causing inflammation. So if the immune system is recognizing cells in the GI tract as foreign, why is it that in Crohn's we have these sort of skips and it can appear anywhere in the GI tract, whereas in UC it's all in it's all confined to the colon? Like is are the two different things or is it the same process that's happening? The bugs are triggering the immune system, the immune system's attacking the body? Or is there different immunology like between so, the two? So there's definitely different immunology between the two. There's definitely different bacterial changes within the two. So if you look at various papers, then they describe different um, upregulation of immune cells and different colonization with bacteria. Um, but there's a lot of fundamentals that are similar in terms of what you're seeing there, you know, you're co you're causing this chronic inflammatory process. Um, quite why Crohn's leads to skip lesions, quite why it likes the last part of the small bowel and the first part of the colon, I, I don't know. And I think there's interesting questions to be asked there about what's going on, you know, what what's the difference between two centimetres of bowel where one part's really inflamed and the next part is perfectly fine. Um, and and I, I can't answer that part for you, but... You know, it would be, it's a it's a fascinating question, and and I think understanding that. Similarly, ulcerative colitis. Often, you can see an ulcerative colitis. So it's a disease that that is classically described as going proximally from the rectum upwards. So it's in continuity from the rectum for an amount of colon. And actually, in in adults, it's often just left sided. In children, it's usually involves most of the colon, if not all of the colon. But you will often see where there's quite a clear demarcation where. It's literally like going from night to day. There's inflamed ulcerative colitis colon and then normal colon above that. Wow. And and what's that? Wow. About? What's going on there? Why why isn't it continuous? Why doesn't it affect everything? Or what's going in in that part? What's going on in that part that protects it? I, right. I, I don't know that. Are there theories for that? Like that, that, that people postulate? Or is it more of a, yeah, it happens and we'll figure it out at some point? I, I think probably the latter. Probably the latter, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, so over the course of your career then, how has the relative importance or the perceived importance of the microbiome changed? You know, going back to your first interest in 2004. Yeah. Like, were you one of the only people that was interested in the microbiome and gastroenterology? I mean, I think I'm kind of lucky because I, um, so I got interested in this. So as I say, we kind of, I cut off that story to talk about what IBD was, but in, in about 2004, um, I kind of realized that there was this, people were starting to talk, talk about gut bacteria, about probiotics, about colonization. You know, at that time, I probably hadn't quite decided between being a neonatologist or being a gastroenterologist. And neonatologists look after very sick infants. Uh, and a lot of them, not a lot of them, that's not true, but some of them who are the most fragile and most premature will get a condition called necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a bit like a, a sort of short-term severe uh, IBD that burns itself out. Um, so it's got very similar features in a lot of ways and it's certainly driven by, there's definitely a, an association with bacteria in the gut and colonization of the gut and the introduction of foodstuffs to these premature babies. But but it is all, it's also a very different process. And I got quite interested in that and I got interested in this emergence of probiotics and whether this was going to, you know, there was a lot of buzz about how it would start to change things and, and make new therapies available. And that didn't really play out, but it kind of sparked my curiosity and then I had an opportunity to go and do a PhD uh, looking at what was happening in gut bacteria in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and I, I did that with um, uh, Pr Professor Georgina Holt and Professor Ima Delomar at Aberdeen, University of Aberdeen. And I, when I started that project, the way that you would describe the gut bacteria uh, or, the, or the microbiome, so the microbiome describing all the bacteria that live with you, um, was to uh, basically clone uh, individual strands of DNA into different E. coli and grow them up on lots of plates. And the more plates you did, the more bacteria you could sequence uh, and find out what they were. And so you could do this on 100 different plates with 100 different bacteria and then get them all. And it was very, essentially, it was a very slow and laborious and challenging process. Um, and that, was that the and state of the art? That was the state of that the was art, the state of the art when, I, time, when I started my PhD in about 2009. Wow. But but during that period, there was the emergence of this thing called next generation sequencing, where instead of putting all those strands of DNA that relate to all the different bacteria into E. coli cells to grow them up, they they bound to little beads and dropped into a little well on a big machine. 
Um, and if you paid enough money to get enough of these wells sequenced on a big machine, you could sequence the, the, the microbiome in a kind of almost, almost in a single step, not quite in a single step, but compared to that previous method. And you used to be limited by how many E. coli you could grow up on plates, maybe a hundred. Um, and then you were limited basically by the budget of how many um, little wells you bought on the sequencing machine, which, which was called sequencing reads uh, when it comes out the other end. And so you were suddenly going to 30,000, 50,000, however many, you know. And, and I think that's where the game started to change because you suddenly had a way of being able to do this, which was quicker, more efficient, more detailed. Um, you were getting much deeper sequencing of what was going on. And uh, it started to take over uh, really medicine, actually, and, and, and science. And you start to see these big papers coming out that are describing what is and isn't going on with the gut microbiome. And I suppose along the way, people got very interested in this concept of microbial therapeutics, which is, OK, we're describing this thing. We know it's important. We can see that there are 300 to 400 bacterial species in someone's gut. We see that there are differences in ups and downs, depending on what disease state you're describing. How do we actually harness that? How do we change that? And, and I suppose, to me, I think we're still in that revolution. I don't think that's... I think it has taken off, but I don't think it's quite gone full logarithmic acceleration phase yet. And I, I, the excited part of me is that I think that's still to come. And I think we will see big changes to, for instance, inflammatory bowel disease management, but maybe many other uh, human conditions um, through the advent of microbial therapeutics. So the going back to the next generation sequencing element, so based on what I understand it was and is a game changer because instead of having to manually play out 100, yeah. say, and that doesn't even capture the 300 to 400 that's in there, yeah, you're taking a sample and doing some work on it, moving it into the next generation sequencing technology, and that allows you to profile everything that's there to a certain level, yeah. essentially. Yeah. So it's revolutionary, and and so how how did you become aware of it, and then how did that influence your PhD, and then like the work that you were doing moving forward? So I read a paper, and uh, it had described having done this in an, in another cohort, and I I presented that to our group, I suppose, and I said, you know, we were all getting set up. I'd been collecting biopsies from children with IBD at their first presentation, and we were collecting those and putting them in a freeze, and we were doing various other things. We were trying to grow particular organisms from them. We were doing some PCRs for specific organisms, but we had this growing cohort of um, pediatric colonic biopsies from the, the onset of inflammatory bowel disease. And Those we samples were, must be very valuable, uh, right? Well, they, they, they were, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's quite a while now, yeah. quite a while ago now. Yeah. But yeah, the, and it, the, the concept was, if we want to understand this thing, then surely we need to go to the first op opportunity. Because if you look at somebody's gut bacteria after they've had the IBD for five years or 10 years, or they've had gut resections or they've had various treatments, then that's going to be different. It's going to be influenced by that. Whereas we thought, well, if we could go to the very beginning of the disease, then w what are we going to find out from that? Um, and actually, subsequently, other groups, there's a, there's a, a study uh, run uh, from Canada called the GEM study that has taken that idea a step further, which looks at um, healthy first degree relatives of people who've got IBD to follow them through, because if you follow enough of them, then you can see them as they start to develop IBD. So you might be able to even get those changes before it happens and as it happens. So... We're all excited to see what exactly comes out of that. Is that, is that running like kind of as we speak? It's been... Yeah, it's just, it's recently closed recruitment, I think, and they, and they have published a couple of things, but they haven't published, you know, big killer data on exactly right. what's going on there. So we're uh, all excited about uh, that. And are they measuring sort of stool samples, biopsies, it's blood, everything? So, so, so it's stool samples for their study, and that's because it's hard to, it's hard to get biopsy samples without doing an endoscopy and it's hard to do an endoscopy without all of the paraphernalia that goes about and in my population without general anaesthetic so that's that's okay. challenging okay so we got this cohort and i said um we're going to do this cloning and sequencing thing but actually this next generation sequencing is arriving you know could we look at doing this and we didn't really have the costing for that but we got we we put in a small grant we got about i think thirty five thousand pounds from a, a, car, a, a great charity called kikra which is Crohn's and Childhood Research Association, so they're specific to paediatric uh, research. And they funded the next generation sequencing, and we did that on, on 
a cohort from that um, study and we published that. And I, I think we were the first in the literature to publish on what the gut microbiota was in biopsies from children at their first presentation wow. with IBD. So, wow. And did you see any changes in the microbiome on the biopsy versus the lumen? And is there a difference? So we didn't we didn't specifically study that in. So this this was called the biscuit study. Um, it was the acronym that we used for that study, and we didn't specifically look at stool against biopsies. And we did that for specific and pragmatic reasons. And this is one of the challenges about clinical science: is you've got to be a great pragmatist. You 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 would like to sit down and devise everything to great detail and say we're going to look at this and this and this in this context. Um, but then as soon as you take that to the real world and you start trying to think about how you're going to apply that, then you immediately meet challenges. And the first challenge I met with thinking, well, we'll get stool samples and we get biopsy samples was, well, these children are coming in for a diagnostic endoscopy for their query IBD or in some cases controls who don't have IBD. Um, and uh, they're arriving in the hospital for bowel preparation for overnight. So they uh, pretty much as soon as they're admitted, someone gives them something that makes them poo more than they normally would. So the first poo that you're going to get out is going to be more watery. It's going to be affected by a faster transit. It's not reflective it's not representative. of what their stool would be normally. So we quite quickly realized that we couldn't do that in that study. So we had to focus on the biopsy samples. But other people have looked at stool against biopsy and they're two distinct ecosystems. So th there's a lot of there's a lot of utility in stool because it's very convenient and you can sample it without the need for an endoscopy and you can sample it serially, but it's not necessarily the same thing as what's happening at the gut mucosa. And again, my analogy for that is is like the the beach and the ocean. You know, there will be things that you'll see right. in both environments, right. but there's also going to be things that are unique to both. So are we missing a trick, so to speak? with all these microbiome studies that we're doing, sort of drawing conclusions between healthy people versus controls, sorry, healthy people and controls versus disease population insofar as it's all stool-based microbiome analysis. Well, we 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 might be. I I think it's still. I think it's very much got a role. And I think you know, if for instance, so we use disease controls, if you like, for that study as an example. So we use children who were having a colonoscopy for another reason who didn't turn out to have inflammatory bowel disease. But the threshold for getting a colonoscopy under general anaesthetic is not insignificant. Sure. So these are kids who've got other symptoms and probably have something like an irritable bowel syndrome, or some of them had a polyp or something, you know, something different to inflammatory bowel disease. But they're not the same as healthy children who are in a play park, you know, and that's an important distinction. Um, but you can't take healthy children who are in a play park or you can't take healthy, you know, men and women who, who work and have jobs and who are not affected by disease and just take them in and do endoscopies on them for the sake of taking biopsies because it suits your biologic integrity, you know, your 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 desire to get to the pure answer. So there's a compromise there, which is, okay, what's most important here? Is it is it sampling bigger cohorts? Is it sampling cohorts that are closer to healthy to compare against? Um, is it doing different time point analysis? Or is it saying, no, I'm going to be so stuck on the fact that I want biopsy samples because I know that that's different, that I'm going to limit everything to that. So that's the pragmatic thing again, isn't it? You know, it's about how, how do you choose? And I think the truth is there's a bit of both that's needed. You know, I think that if and when we can sample the, the mucosa by biopsies and endoscopy, we probably should. Um, if if we can't and we need to do, and particularly for longitudinal studies, this is really critical, you need to be able to do it quicker and, and easier. And so therefore collecting stools makes sense. Uh, another thing about stools that's helpful though is with a stool, you can start to correlate the results that you get from that with an inherent property of that from the fecal calprotectin. So fecal calprotectin is a protein that can be used as a, as a biomarker of inflammation. And we use it to help us decide whether someone might or might not have inflammatory bowel disease before we do endoscopies. So if it's raised, so, then you've yeah. got a higher index yeah. of suspicion. Yeah. So if you do five stools from someone and you look at what happens to their bacteria over that 
period and you also look at what happens to their calprotectin, then you can actually infer something from that. You okay. know, lower calprotectin means less inflammation, means you're controlling the disease better, and what's the bacteria changing in response to that? And so. I guess you could maybe go one step further and look at the Bristol stool score as well as an even like higher macroscopic, you know, analysis of yeah. transit time. Yeah, so you're getting to another point here, which is is probably important and probably underappreciated in a lot of studies, which is um, if your gut is inflamed, your transit time, which means basically the speed it takes for something to go through, your gut and come out the bottom end is faster and so if it's faster the change the bacteria are going to be changed and you know by that so so how do you how do you account for that and what what does that look like so there's a there's a lot of complexity in trying to understand and devise microbiome studies um and i guess there's this big big question which is are the changes in the microbiome driving or are part of the disease pathogenesis versus are they a consequence of whatever is going on? Yeah, it's chicken and egg. The chicken and it? the egg. Yeah. And I was going to ask yeah. you specifically, because we've talked about it before, and it's a toughie. Yeah. What's your personal view on... And you mentioned, you know, you've got this journey. Yeah. No IBD, healthy. Hump, Humpty Dumpty, conundrum day. Yeah. Where they fall off. And then you've got post-diagnosis um, and symptomatology. So... I guess if there was some way of figuring out before they fall off that they're going to, then you can maybe intervene sooner. Um, and yeah, yeah so, so do you think that the microbiome changes are the cause or the effect of the inflammation that's happening in the gut? It's a, it's a really great question. I, I think they're causative, um, but I think they can become the effect as well. And I, and I think that's probably, you know, one of the hypotheses that, that, that our group had, and I think we published this quite a long time ago now, about 10 years ago, was this idea of, so there's this word called dysbiosis, which basically means that your, your um, gut bacteria are imbalanced and the net effect of that imbalance is inflammation. Um, and Professor Holt will say she doesn't like that word. She doesn't like she that She doesn't word. like it anymore. No, I don't think so. No. <laughs> well, you, you can ask her when you interview her. But, <laughs> I will do, yeah. Um, but, you know, dys, dysbiosis is this word that, that, that's been in vogue for quite a long time within this sphere. And uh, in inflammatory bowel disease, it's thought to be an IBD-type dysbiosis where there's reduced bacterial diversity, there's increase in particular bacterial populations and reductions of other ones, and the net effect is inflammation. And we kind of postulated that maybe the Humpty Dumpty event is something comes along and it drives you into dysbiosis. And perhaps for you or I, if we go to a barbecue and we eat a, a undercooked chicken sandwich and we end up with Campylobacter and we spend five days in the toilet and we're not very well, we've gone into dysbiosis. Um, but we then come out of it again. So it's like an unstable dysbiosis where y your, your body can right that and fix that problem. And, and then and you come back out of that again. Sorry, Richard, that, that fixing element, what happens there? Does the existing ecosystem just sort itself out a little bit and just push out the Campylobacter saying, yeah, I don't want you here anymore? It's or? a great question. I don't think we know enough about that. And I think that, you know, it's it's a really interesting area to get into. Um, it, yes, the immune system is going to be involved in some way in terms of clearing the organism and setting things up again. Yes, you will gonna, you're going to have a period where your diet has changed and then changed back again. And most people don't immediately go from having a severe bacterial gastroenteritis to eating exactly what they ate again, uh, you know, the, the day afterwards kind of thing. So there is a that there is a, a process of, re of returning to your own physiology. But probably there is a, a process where your your bacteria redeem themselves somehow. And that that's unknown. There, there are some hypotheses that the appendix plays a role and might be, you know, that it might be that the physiological role of the appendix is to store bacteria so that when you have something like this, then it can say, oh, you need these now and sort of spill them out into the gut lumen and say, here you go. Wow. Um, I so, I'd never heard that so, before. There you go. So so this, this is, whole conversation was worthwhile. Oh, then. absolutely! I've learned so much already, and I knew I would. I was really looking forward to this. Um, on the appendix, then. Yeah. Lots of people every year have their appendix removed. Are they based on objective evidence that we've collated over time more likely to become infected with a pathogen, or are they more likely to get IBD? Like. What do we know about people that have had so uh, appendicectomy? 
Uh, so I, I believe appendectomy is protective against ulcerative colitis. So there is actually, that, that seems to benefit you. Uh, I hope I've got that the right way around, but I think that's the case. You put me on the spot there oh, with that sorry, one. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, we can pull it up. We can pull it up. We can do a Google. But, um, I'm not saying Google's better than you. But. It doesn't seem to be that that's a major problem for most people. Um, and, you know, like a lot of these things, whenever you do a study to try and understand what the impact of something is within medicine, there's always confounders that come along there that, that play into that. You know, so for instance, and, and I've mentioned that Campylobacter or Salmonella infection increases your risk of IBD. And so you can play that out one way, which is that that process starts the Humpty Dumpty thing that drives IBD in the first place. Or you could play it backwards and say people who have IBD are more likely to be susceptible to Campylobacter and Salmonella infections. It's got nothing to do with causing their IBD. It's just that, that that's a marker of the fact that they're that person, do you know? Um, and sense. so if you do the same thing with going back with the appendicectomy, uh, you, you might well find that there are other reasons why people a appendectomy that that are actually the true cause of whatever it is that you then associate with it five ten years down the line. So, um, I you know I'm by no means expert in in bacterial reconstitution after a, a gastroenteritis episode, but it's a fascinating subject. Do you think that? And this is just a really blue sky type thing now relating to diarrhea and travel. You could collect stool samples from people who live in the area you're going to, who are exposed to the microorganisms that live predominantly within that geography. Yep. Go through the process of screening for pathogens that are really nasty, putting it into a capsule or a tablet, and then giving it to people before they travel to sort of condition their microbiome to what's coming. Do you think that they would have less traveler's diarrhea or is that pie in the sky you might just give them traveler's you, diarrhea well, that was the thing i was thinking as i that was might describing be it, it to you, you might have yeah, just caused yeah, it you might have given them the diarrhea so it might be the new bugs. diarrhea pills that's it i don't think that will sell very it's well no, will it? no 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 uh, but you know it, it's hard to, it's hard to know it's hard to know and um i think there's a there's a kind of fundamental thing there which is uh, and this is i'm sure we'll talk about you know fecal transplant or where we've gone with fecal transplant but um for sure th th there's there's quite a lot of interest in how fecal transplant or taking stool and the bacteria from stool from one person who doesn't have disease and transplanting that into the gut of another person who does have disease. Predominantly, there's two indications really. There's Clostridium difficile or Clostridioides difficile. It changed its name a couple of years ago, I'm sure you know. And ulcerative colitis um, are the two things that people are most interested in. Uh, and in ulcerative colitis, there's probably a signal that pooling pooling donors together is beneficial. So people who have actually done not just one donor into one recipient, but have actually taken multiple donors into one recipient seem to do a little bit better. And I suppose I, I remember seeing a study from Australia presented at a conference about this and I I asked them about how they how they think about or avoid friendly fire between those communities um, because um, you have got communities that are all set up individually to live in a person and you've just thrown them all together and put them into another community and said, here, get on, and kind of hoping that that, that causes peace. But how do you know that it doesn't just cause further warfare? And I suppose that comes back to your question about the, the, the traveler's diarrhea pill is y y you might well have a balanced uh, microbiome from one individual who lives in a certain area and eats certain food but if you give that to another person there's there's no guarantee there that, that they're going to tolerate that the same way because they're not set up the same way their diet's not the same their immune system's not the same and it might well cause the diarrhea that you're trying to prevent in the first place quite possibly but it might not you know and, and that's why this science is quite complex and exciting is is that the answers are not straightforward that's one thing that's for sure just over the course of this conversation there's still so much to learn yeah. and so much benefit for patients on the hopefully not too distant horizon once we start to un unravel and answer these questions you know like when to intervene in patients with an IBD family relative or whatever yeah like and so let's go back to the IBD and and the sort of studies that the GEM study do you think that there might be a signature in their microbiome which is consistent across patients, even if it's just reductions in diversity for argument's sake, relative to an earlier time point, that have some sort of reasonable predictive value of them going on to develop IBD? Like, do you think that's where we're going to get to? Or is that too simplistic a, a view? I, it would be great. It would be great if that was true. I, I, 
I suppose, and again, I'm, it is blue sky thinking here now, you know, I don't have data to support this, but I probably think that the more likely thing is that people will go from a, a microbiome that is is okay and would be described as healthy into a kind of pre-morbid state where things are starting to change. Um, uh, and sometimes I suppose that might be quite acute, you know, so we've used some examples of that, talking about bacterial infection, how that might change things, but sometimes that might be slow. And that might be a place where you can find a window where you're able to say, okay, for instance, your diversity index is dropping. I'm making this up now. This is not yep. something to, for people to go and pursue, but your diversity index is dropping. So this is a time where we might be able to intervene and change that and and stop a process. That, or, would, that would be great. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Um, but strain I, X is yeah. dropping. Yeah. Strain Y is but going I, up. I don't think we're there yet, you know? No. Although it is possible to send your stool in the post to someone, charge, pay a lot of money for that, and for them to send you a report that tells you exactly what's going we on. We should and talk what about that. So, so <laughs> what do you do then as a clinician? Someone comes in, they paid the money, yeah. they've got the 16S profile yeah. here. They come in and they go, there it is, doctor. Yeah. What do I do? I, I I prefer it when they come and ask me whether this is a worthwhile thing before they spend their money on it. And, and in that case, I tell them that they shouldn't spend their money on it. And when they come having done it already, I generally say it's hard for me to tell you what this means. And there's lots of reasons for that. And I actually, I, I seem to be a bit of a conduit for this where other professionals will say, my patients come to me with this report ah. and I've received this. So what what does this mean? And so I have to give this answer quite a lot. There's lots of reasons, um, not least that if you actually take a stool sample and you put, send it somewhere at room temperature, you're not controlling that environment anymore and that's changed. Um, but uh, right. also that, you know, as someone who's research active within this whole sphere, I, I don't know what a healthy microbiome is for an individual. You know, I can probably tell you some aspects of what a microbiome looks like for a group of healthy individuals and how that compares with another group of individuals. But as I said to you before, everyone's different and so they're you know your 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 gut microbiome is unique as unique to you as a fingerprint you know or as your dna sequence um and it's pretty specific to you as well so you, you might well have james McElroy bacteria in your gut that you get on fine with that would cause me a whole load of trouble and vice versa you know mm. so it's really hard to say okay now that the parameters within this report mean that these populations are low and this should be changed this is a bad thing you know because for that person they might not be and i i i do think we need to get there i do think that as a clinical community you know right now i suppose i said 15 20 years however long into this thing you know if we think about the advent of next generation sequencing and sort of 2000 and nine, ten-ish, we're probably talking about 12, 13 years uh, into this gut microbiome um, era. Um, it's still impossible for any clinician, certainly in the UK and probably most places in the world, if not everywhere in the world, to take a sample from a patient and send it to a lab and have their microbiome analysed and have a report come back to them that means anything. This is still the sphere of you know, scientific experiment within university laboratories on a kind of single cohort or single patient experience. Um, and so if we're actually going to do microbial therapeutics and be able to say, okay, for instance, a patient has ulcerative clients, we're going to try a fecal transplant on them uh, for clinical purposes out with the sphere of a clinical trial, we're going to have to be able to address that at some point in this journey where we can actually say, okay, you know, Mrs. Bloggs has come along, we're going to, she has ulcerative colitis, she's got active disease, we're thinking of a fecal transplant, we're going to look at her microbiome and see whether she's a candidate for this and then we're going to do it and then we're going to see whether it's worked or not or with C. difficile infection or whatever. But that doesn't exist right now and, and we will need to get there. So I think there will be a need to start to understand these things enough that we can do that and we can deploy these tools as clinical tools and not just academic tools. But but we're not there. And so save your money. Save your money. There we go. But on the IBD front and faecal transplantation, let, let, let's jump into that now. And I'm conscious we need to go back and talk about EEN and, and kids too, but feel like we're there so let's 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 go for it so fecal transplantation the movement of microorganisms from a healthy donor into the intestinal tract yep. of a recipient tended to prevent or cure disease in c diff there's been a large number of studies nice guidelines it's established for the prevention of recurrence 
you see it sounds sounds like there's six studies now. Yeah, there's six. Six, I think. six uh, RCTs published as of You've this week. Rosen, Costello, Param Sothe, another Australian study. Yep. And then there's the Israeli the, study, and there's an Indian one just published. An Indian this week. one as well. So, so in your opinion, then, like, are we there now? With UC, like, is this is this a is this real? We've seen six studies and but we've not uh, out of those six studies uh, uh, and I, i'm not as good at saying this study said this this study said that this study said the next thing I, I my brain doesn't work like that for some reason so i, I can't immediately say here's what the risk ratio was for that but the messages are that uh, actually uh, uh, although there are studies and there are randomized trials and there is data there and there is a support for this they they all took slightly different approaches in terms of what the control was about how the fmt was delivered um in some ways about how they prepared the fmt yep. about whether or not they were pooled donors or not pooled donors yep. you know the, the most recent two that were published um also did dietary manipulations one of those did dietary manipulations on the donors and then on the recipients oh, and the most recent one from this week uh, just did the recipients and they went on to a, a kind of anti-inflammatory diet to try and support and grow and some of these things are not wow. are not um, wow. are, are, you know trying to understand what the hypothesis was and what the thinking was can be a little tricky about dietary and manipulation and I suppose whenever you you know if you go out with an umbrella and red socks on and your hair doesn't get wet was it the umbrella or the red socks <laughs> you know right. um, I hear you and so it, trying to ask complex questions can be quite tricky when you're pulling things but it, I suppose how I would respond to that is there's a signal Okay, there's definitely a signal that ulcerative colitis can be improved by fecal transplant if you give the right transplant, whatever that means, to the right person, whatever that means, um, by the right route, which is probably colonic. Okay, um, and the right number of times, and the right number of times, and so, it, and it might be lost over time as well. So fascinating. Uh, so I, I think you know. There's a there's a video on YouTube and I feel sorry for this guy and I, I, it would be terrific if you could see this because this is me apologising to him. But there's a oh I thought you said it would be there, good if we can pull it up because no, we, we could pull well you it could up. you could yeah. if you want yeah. but there's a there's a guy on YouTube called uh, Michael Hurst and he has a video called DIY transplant for fecal uh, DIY fecal transplant for ulcerative colitis and he shows you in kind of both very clean and very graphic form, uh, clean graphic form, how to administer your own fecal transplant to treat your ulcerative colitis. Now, I um, my stock recommendation to any of my patients or anyone who asks me that is, you know, you, you wouldn't do a bone marrow transplant having seen a video off YouTube. And so you shouldn't do a fecal transplant for the same reason. Right. So, and actually the same, it, it's a really helpful thought experiment to think about bone marrow transplant when you think about fecal transplant because they're actually the same thing in a lot of ways. You know, you have a donor and a recipient and those two need to match. Um, you have to do prior conditioning to change the environment so that the, the graft will, will actually go in and, and embed and work. And then you need to follow that through carefully to ensure that it's still done what it's wanted to do, okay? And I think those are exactly true of fecal transplant, um, but we don't know what the parameters are quite yet, you know, so- Can I just push back a little yeah. on the preconditioning? Yeah, for the fecal transplant, what what element of preconditioning do you think is required? So is it the, the bowel prep, or an antibiotic? Or? Yeah, I, I don't, don't know. I don't know. Mm. And so so people have tried different things. So I suppose if I throw the things that people have tried to use, people have used um, proton pump inhibitors to reduce acidity, particularly when they use nasogastric fecal transplant. They've used loperamide to slow the gut to try and keep the transplant in place longer in the hope that it will colonize better. You know, they've they've used preconditioning with antibiotics in Bank. the hope of opening up an ecological niche to try and um, help colonization. Um, and of course, I suppose dietary manipulation either for the, the donor or the recipient can be considered preconditioning or maybe even post-conditioning depending on how you do it and when you do it and what that looks like. So you could immediately see how many parameters there are that, there are, that are shifting and yet here we are, what, six randomized control trials which have all taken a slightly different approach to this. Absolutely. So how do you start to pull it apart? So what does success look like and what does that mean? And that's still difficult. Do you think that given the, I'll call it heterogeneity, although it's not, you know, by the dictionary what we're talking about here, but given that in the Dutch study, the Rosen study, there was two IMTs or FMTs. And in one of the Australian studies, the Param Sothe, they did like 40. They did one colonoscopy yeah. in itself. And there was the anaerobic processing. Yes, yeah, so this is a sort of aerobic. treatment duration. Yeah, yeah. 
all the methods of prep, all the things that we were saying made yeah. them difficult to compare. But on the one hand, I hear what you're saying totally that it's difficult to compare because the methodology is different, the patient population is yeah. different, the endpoints differ. Yeah. So the Mori Eddy study had a really tough endpoint, yeah. I think. Yeah. Is there some, you know, as I, as a clinician scientist, can you look at all of that and go, okay, a lot of difference, but the signal. Yeah, no, there's a signal the, every time. The, the, so this concept of moving microbes from one person to another in yeah. UC is there's something there, right? I, I, undoubtedly, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not disputing that there's something there. I, I, but I suppose I, I want to understand, I want to understand when it works, how it works, because that's how we move For your forward. Patients. Yeah, that's right. how we move forward. Right. You know, and it, it, and this is where it gets a bit interesting, isn't it? Because if you give FMT, FMT to UC patients and a hundred percent of them went into clinical remission and they stayed in clinical remission, if this is a thought experiment, okay, then right. It wouldn't matter that much. No. It wouldn't matter that much. I mean, much that would be a because, wonderful thing. Because it's effective, you know, and you just, everybody pats themselves on the back and we just crack on and we do this. And maybe in a few years' time, when we've cured all these people of UC, we think, I wonder how it works. Can we refine that further? But that question is not as, as pertinent as it is right now. But that's not what we're seeing. We're probably seeing efficacy rates of somewhere between 25 and maybe 60%, depending on which study you look at, um, against placebo rates, which are also not insignificant. You know, So the, so this, irrespective of what placebo you give, we are seeing some placebo response in most of these studies as well. And so we we need to understand why is it working in these people? You know, um, I think it was the Maidi study that had a super donor that seemed to be most right. effective. Donor B, yeah, so that seems to be most effective. <laughs> donor B, yeah. uh, that uh, in terms of um, driving people well, into remission. I, I can say from an industry perspective that donor B study yeah. catalyzed the formation of many microbiome companies that said, "Well, we're going to look at these FMT IMT studies." We're going to look at the sequencing data, pre and yeah. post intervention, and, and if there's a correlation or a cluster towards certain strains in the phenotype of interest, like clinical remission, that's a drug candidate. Yeah. Now, as far as I'm aware, we don't have any asset in late stage development. That's a defined consortia for UC. And um, I haven't seen the donor B phenomenon explained by anybody, and I'd imagine they've analysed everything in that study. And I've not seen it really replicated either in any of the other sort of UC work. So what was that? Was that just, was that a real thing, do you think? Do you think there was a super donor or? I think probably calling it a super donor is, is maybe being uh, too too strong. Um, I feel like that. In fact, to be honest with you, Richard, I think that anybody who passes the screening, which is as rigorous as it is and donates every day for yeah. a few months you could probably call them a super donor right but well, they, they, they actually are <laughs> because, willing to do that they're, because they're willing to do it and they meet all the criteria i mean we'll do an episode on what makes a good donor is yeah. it someone that comes in every day is it someone that has a really massive yeah output and we actually right. uh, i've been involved in the stop colitis consortium as well um that did uh, fecal transplant as a as a pilot trial in in adults um yes uh, across uh, Glasgow, Birmingham and London and uh, we, we went through a lot of these questions in the trial design and um, we there was a point where we were saying what are our exclusion criteria for donors do we want to exclude people who have obesity, do we want to exclude people who are smokers You know, do we want to pool our, our donors together and do a super poo you know um, and we kind of settled on trying to be as simplistic as we could because we didn't want to fall into the trap of of believing we knew something up front and missing the opportunity to find something by accident. You know, right. serendipity still got a huge role to play in scientific discovery. Right. And uh, what you actually want, where this field is going to go, I think, is once we have enough high quality studies where people have done pre and post microbiome and associated that with, you know, uh, whatever markers of remission you like and looked at longevity and everything and compared donor and recipient and trying to figure out what, what matching looks like and which organisms are important, then we'll probably start to understand, okay, this, this is these, I don't think there's going to be one bacterium that you can pull out of all this and say, this is the cure. I don't think that's right. I think what we're going to find is particular uh, donors have an open niche that can be colonized by particular types of organisms. Sorry, I'm bashing my microphone now. <laughs> um, 
and that that will differ in different people and it and it might even be that the that the space that's open up is different and relates to different phyla of bacteria or different you know uh, different classifications of how those bacteria work within the gut uh, in, in different people so well, on the space and niche element there then is that potentially why the pooled product seems to be better than the monodonor product insofar as there's more shots on goal yeah yeah exactly kind of and more shots on goal go is a great analogy yeah you know you you if you're putting a thousand bacteria in and not 200 or you know this is where perhaps how you process it is important too if the bacteria have survived long enough to get to the patient then you might have a better chance of it doing something you know and and, and these things are all worth thinking about too so, I mean, we have actually published together in the past the paper that said pooling. Mm -mm. Uh, I've got a very different view on that now for <laughs> all sorts of different reasons, and that's fine. I think having an open mind that's yeah. that's amenable to change yeah. is is good. But from a scientific point of view, then we've talked about the shots on goal. Is there any other element of if there's more bugs in there, you might get a bigger immune response? Like if there's more diversity, you might trigger the immune system in different ways, or is that not how it works in IBD? Do you well, think? You, you, yeah, you might, you might, and I suppose this is the thing that I've, you know, I, I probably my bias, I, my slight bias against um, pooled donors is twofold. One is I think um, there is a theoretical risk, at least, that you could have what I call friendly fire between those donors' microbiomes, and you you might, you know, impart. A more pro-inflammatory state by doing that. I'm not sure that that's really supported by evidence, and I think you know that that's probably maybe an anxious. Probably the second one is the scientific purist argument, which is the bit we need to get to, which is how does this work? You know, when it works is going to be harder to pull apart when you've put in a thousand organisms and not two hundred. You know, so uh, trying to understand what the key players are and how how they um, have performed and done what they do. Uh, is going to be harder if you're using pooled donors than uh, individual donor. Um, and I suppose pooled donors as a concept is not just about a single treatment. So particularly if you've got longitudinal treatment, pooled donors might also mean that every time you come in, you just get whatever donor comes out the fridge or the freezer, you know, that you're... So actually in stock clients, we matched donor to recipient for their total treatment course. Makes sense. So they always got the same person. And that was for mechanistic reasons as much as anything. Um but on the pooled element, surely if you're doing really robust characterization of the drug product before it goes into the patient, because you've got that data on composition, yeah. does it matter if it's come from multiple different people? Because it is whatever it is that goes in. And as long as no, and it might not. It might not. And and I, I this is where we're getting into speculative science here, you know, and we have to be very careful to not let that ju you know cloud our view and and drive our direction. Because when you don't have data, you should try and find data. You know, I, I've got good reasons to say I'm I'm anxious about that. But similarly, I, I am I, again. We go back to that word pragmatism. I, at my heart, I'm a clinician, and what I want is something that's going to help my patients. You know, and if if something's going to help my patients better with with pooled donations and a thousand bacteria in it versus a single with two hundred in it then I'm, right. I'm all in favour of that. And if, if it takes us longer or it's more complex to get to understanding uh, how that has worked, but the net effect is I'm able to move patients away from stronger immunosuppression and towards microbial therapy and keep them well or for longer, I'm always going to choose it. that journey. You know, that that's an easy win for me. But, um, right. but it, it is, I suppose what I would say in all of that is understanding that signal and getting to the disease biology is so fundamental and we mustn't That's miss the, the opportunity to do that along the way you know we, we shouldn't cloud ourselves to that and we should totally. be open-minded about what's going on and trying to understand you know and I, as i say i don't think it will be a single bacteria or a single group of bacteria uh filling a single role i think that will vary between people but we might be able to describe, I don't know, five or ten distinct things that that are similar. You know, that, that you say, okay, these are the characteristics that seem to be important um, across these people. And we've identified these groupings of, you know, this set seems important, this set seems important over here. Um, the mechanism piece, which is so important, how do we make sure that we are doing the best work we possibly can to understand how these fecal transplants are working? 
Yeah. So that's about characterization, isn't it? That's about characterizing everything as often as you can and as completely as you can. And so that's where, you know, we've, we've talked about next generation sequencing already today. We kind of we kind of didn't talk about exactly what what that is, but, you know, the, 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 we can do the, that. there's two variants, I suppose, to think about. There's Amplicon sequencing, which is the kind of quick uh, version, which is sometimes called 16S, where you sequence one particular gene out of bacteria and you use that as a barcode to describe all the bacteria in the sample. So you then everything after that's inferred. And then there's metagenomic sequencing and where on, you... Sorry, Richard, on the 16S, yeah. how, how does that work? Do all bacteria have this 16S gene? Yeah. And there's some elements that are ubiquitous across yeah. all bacteria, so, but so, some that vary? Yeah, so all bacteria have a 16S gene and uh, it has both highly conserved and highly variable portions. And so you can line up PCR primers uh, to do a, an amplification step against those conserved parts. And in between them, you'll get the, the variable parts. And through that sequenced product, you can compare that to an online database that says, aha, this looks like Staphylococcus aureus, or whatever it is that you're choosing to look at. Um, that database have they ta have they taken the pure culture and sequenced the entire? Not always. Not always. Okay. And it depends on the database you Not use. Always. It depends on the database. So there's you limitations. Use. So then. there are there are always limitations about matching up against uh, and 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 you know good old Dom Donald Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns. You know, if you have a bacterium in there that nobody has sequenced or nobody has cultured before and it's not on the database, it's not going to match against that. You know, it might match against something that's similar to that to a lower percentage value, but it's not going to match against that because you don't know what it is, okay? So, and that that is something that's kind of initially kind of plagued this whole sphere, but I think with time we're probably recognizing that what we thought were unknown bacteria probably is shrinking, you know, and, and, Interesting. Um, and uh, there've been concerted efforts to try and grow some of these organisms which are quite difficult in culture. Um, why, why are some so, bugs so difficult to grow? It, it's, I mean, I find that really interesting because they they managed to get there, yeah, and they're here <laughs> happy. Yeah, you know, There's they managed to get there the best thing. somehow from somewhere, and then they managed to sort of bed in and stay <laughs> there it. and not be bothered too much about <laughs> it. And yet, we've there we are scientists who devote their careers to trying to culture these organisms and, and get the right oxygen concentrations, mm. the right temperature, the right you know, yeah. what, you know. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I, you know, I'm not a conventional culture microbiologist really by any stretch, so I. That, We're going to get someone. That here. sounds like another podcast for another day. Probably, so, yeah. Probably. Um, but metagenomic sequencing is the other approach where basically you take all the bacteria that are there in the sample and you just mash it up and you sequence everything and then you put it back together in a computer again. So your your depth of data analysis, your ability to look at not just what bacteria are there but what functions they contribute is better with a metagenomic approach. But it's not always straightforward to do that. So again, this has got back to our previous discussion about stool versus mucosa. In a stool metagenomic, fine, you can do that quite easily because most of what's in a stool is bacteria. So the, the predominant um, uh, DNA that's going to be in that sample is bacteria. So you're using all that sequencing uh, for good effect on what you're interested in. But of course, if you take a, a gut biopsy from a human, surprise, most of that is human, you know, so 97%-ish of a, of a gut biopsy is human DNA. And so if you're going to do metagenomic sequencing of that, you have to constantly sequence the human genome and throw it away um, to get to the bacteria that you're interested right. so in. So it's harder to, to get more expensive. more expensive. Yeah. And of course, there are ways that you can, you know, micro dissect that and take off the mucosal layer and everything. But does that then mean you might be missing bacteria that reside intracellularly? And what's the significance okay. of that? And are you missing a signal that might be there? You know, so there's, there's a lot at play there in terms of think, thinking about which technique to use. Um, and in terms of the analytical toolkit more generally then, what else do we have other than the next generation sequencing that could add value to these characterization studies we're talking about? I, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I suppose I'm a clinician and not a lab scientist and I have to be careful about that. And I think, uh, you know, a lab scientist would give you a much more detailed uh, view because that's their sphere of practice. Mm -hmm. um, but you're, you're interesting though, because you, you're... I think quite rare insofar as you're at the cutting edge of the science because you're scientifically trained with your PhD, but you also see patients all the time and you can help yeah. bridge the two. I yeah. It's so important because there's so many times you speak to someone, oh, we've got this amazing new technology. It was an amazing idea. It's going to be so good. Yeah. And then they bring it to a clinician and they just go, 
that's just never going to work. Yeah. Because this is how a hospital works and these patients, by the way, they're people and they're just never going to do that. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's really, it would be good to hear your perspectives on the toolkit. So the the toolkit, I suppose the sequencing is really good because it lets us know what's there and it, and it does that in a, in a kind of hypothesis free way without the biases of things like culture, you know, because if you try and culture a stool, for instance, to try and get bacteria out of that and find out what's there, you're always going to find things that are better at growing will come to top. So E. coli, can be a good example of that, grows really easily in most environments and so it will grow first and in yeah. doing that it will outcompete other bacteria for nutrition and it will you know squeeze them down and you'll not see them as much you know so that's a good reason why using stool culture or other cultures is is a problem because you're not getting a kind of pure representation of what's going on there the the culture bias creeps in and starts to change that um but culturing bacteria is still helpful and important because then you have a bacterium in front of you you can look at that in its own uh, in its own right in terms of okay what do we know about this bacterium and its cell surface proteins about how it interacts with immune cells you know about what its growth criteria and conditions are let's sequence its genome and see what genes it expresses and you know um what um what toxins it might produce you might think about things like antibiotic resistance, which you could obviously do in a lab setting, but you know you might increasingly be able to do by genome sequencing. And um, so, you know that that's one example of how growing bacteria can still be helpful, and is probably is probably a bit of a dying art in this field because everyone's rushed over towards to molecular sequencing. You know. Um, but in addition to the uh, approaches of uh, you know sequencing bacteria, there's this whole this whole package of things called multiomics, which basically describes all these different technologies that can be applied uh, to different st- sample sets. You know, our, our my colleague um, Professor Costas Gerasimidis, who kind of leads up our scientific group in Glasgow. He's a great fan of short chain fatty acids as a kind of marker of what the bacteria are up to, you know. Um, so we, we we do those alongside our stool samples for looking at what the ba- what bacteria are there, but also you know what are they up to and what does that tell us about their metabolic activity. Um, you know, you could look at what proteins they're generating as a sort of proteomic approach, or even what proteins the host is producing in response to that. Wow. Um, or so much. You know, there's so there's an infinite number of scientific approaches you can now apply to this but the challenge becomes actually the size of these data sets is enormous and the data analysis required to try and integrate them and to pull that together into a single question becomes very complex um, but in that li- in there lies great opportunity to try and understand disease in ways that we've not thought of yet you know so if you throw a multi-omics approach at something and cut ca- catch all these different huge data sets and you also have good clinical and this is why my part my part becomes important as well and where my expertise is probably relevant is good clinical definition of who this person is what they have we talked earlier about okay they've got Crohn's in one part but not in the other part so that we would, might describe that as their phenotype you know right. what phenotype of Crohn's do they have what what is their blood cells and immune workup look like what medications they're on what the drug levels of those medications are all that part is as relevant as all the scientific toolkit to try and understand what's going on not just in this person but in this cohort of people right and then let's throw a digital question at that and that digital question might be um, how do we tell the difference between responders and non-responders? You based, know, based on the microbiome, based on whatever, all of that, all of and that, right. and see what comes out. And is this part of the? I don't know it's a buzzword, but the AI piece yeah. does that fit in? Yeah, so that's the, that's why this is starting to change and starting to become very exciting. There's this n- new-ish concept. Prob- so probably someone in the field will say we've been talking about this for twenty years. <laughs> to me, <laughs> almost certainly, it's, yeah. it's new. You know, this idea of machine learning. So basically, that you you basically have a computer that goes through all of that and tries to look for signal, and the the benefit of that really is that the computer doesn't care what your favorite bacterium is, you know, or how much effort or energy or expense you've spent on this part of the scientific process. If the signal's up here, it's going to show you that that's where the signal is, you know? And so, you know, the the purest scientists might say, well, you're kind of getting away from the core scientific principle of having a hypothesis and testing that hypothesis. And you're now just rolling into what does the machine tell us? But of course, the machine might point us in directions we haven't thought of yet and say, okay, the, the most important signal in ulcerative colitis is this one protein being synthesized up here. And if you can yep. target that, then, you know, so we might change could the paradigm the, of disease. Could be the red sock and not the umbrella. Could be the red and, sock. And, yeah. and, and the machine 
it doesn't have the biases that I guess we do. I suppose it's programmed by us, so maybe it does. But So are you implementing the machine learning into your work now? Yeah, we are a bit, you know, and I think that's the step that has come from, it used to be about bioinformatics, which is about transforming all those data sets into usable data that you can put into a spreadsheet or into SPSS or whatever and to do an analysis on. But as you pile on more and more data sets within this multi-omics sphere, you need to find ways of integrating those and to and still interrogating it. And that's where machine learning has come in, really. And, and that's you know, that's probably our major use of it is to try and integrate complex data sets and to try and answer, you know, but it's all about both the simplicity of the question that you ask and also that that question is pertinent. And the quality of the data that goes yeah. in, right? Because yeah. I suppose yeah. you need the, the data to be true and valid for the signal that it picks up to be true and yeah. valid as well. But you also need true experts in all aspects of that analysis, you know, so, so the bioinformaticists that we've had who've helped us with our data set and these, you know, machine learning experts, many of whom are bioinformaticists, that's a really sought after uh, right. specialty uh, within, right. within the scientific community right now. Are there clinicians who, trained clinicians who are now getting into this expertise as well? Is it still more of like a basic science, bioinformatics, computer science type thing. Yeah, I I don't think, I, I feel quite strongly about this. I don't think that's our role. And I probably very specifically think that it's almost important, like a lot of clinicians do believe that they can just be a jack of all trades because they're quite smart people and they've gone on a journey and they understand the disease. But, you know, these tools change very quickly. And I, I remember when I was doing, we talked about, about my doing my first next generation sequencing project earlier. And I remember distinctly the day that my data arrived back, you know, here I was a kind of young registrar doing a PhD, keen on this, excited about this 35,000 pounds we spent on sequencing. The data came back. I excitedly downloaded it to my computer, <laughs> you know, and I thought, I can't wait yeah. to see what, what I've got back. Yeah. And what I got back was one text notepad text file of four gigabytes of A's and C's and T's and G's <laughs> and some okay. little tags, you yep. know? And, and at that moment, yeah. I transformed my understanding of what this was all about to the point that, okay, I need someone who gets this and who can turn this into something that I can understand because I can't go there. And for a while, I entertained the idea of like, I'm going to teach myself to be that person because I want to be able to get into this, you know? But if I'd done that in 2012 or whenever that was, in 2022, it's it's irrelevant. The tools have all moved on. There's different iterations. There's different processes. You it's moved know. on a lot, it, hasn't it? Huge, yeah. you know. So let's let specialists be specialists. You know, let's not pretend that the right. clinician's job is to be a bioinformaticist. It isn't. Right. The clinician's job is to define the clinical cohort and the clinical question, and to make sure that the clinical part is good, but also to be able to understand enough about these things to be conversant with these people about what it is that we need from them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's the role. And that goes back to. You know, this eventually has to be something that a patient is is going to take. Yeah. So it has to be designed for a patient ultimately, and it has to also, I suppose, be suitable for the hospital and, and yeah. be practical. You know. So, so we talk about FMT in children. Yeah, we can. So, some big questions. You're moving an adult microbiome usually into a pediatric yeah. patient. That's that's a big question, yeah. right? So I guess zooming out a little bit, does the microbiome vary between a child and an adult in terms of like what's in there? And uh, yes and no. So probably what we know about this is that, um, so we've talked before about how everyone's microbiome is, is unique. Um, and what probably happens is you your gut microbiome has a developmental process just like the rest of your body does. So just like a child goes from uh, lying still to sitting up to standing, holding on, to cruising around furniture, to walking, to running, to hopping, to riding a bike, right? right. Your microbiome goes from... And, the, the, you know, if we start this question at the very beginning, is the gut sterile when a baby is born? Um, and that that fundamental question is still one that the is community it? tussles with a little bit. Probably not. Okay. Oh, interesting. So almost, I thought it was. Almost everyone who has looked at first stool samples, including our group or including myself, uh, have found that you can see evidence of bacteria from even the first stools that you take out of a baby. Okay. Um, so you probably wow. have... Where's it coming from then? Uh, so, and again, this is another question. So there's, there's breast milk's not sterile either. There are bacteria present in breast milk. And other people have looked at things like the placenta and the uterine environment and have also found evidence of bacteria. Now, 
There are challenges because um, when you do PCR techniques, they're very, very sensitive and they can be sensitive to contaminants as well. Um, but there's there's increasingly a kind of reproduci reproducible signal that there are bacteria present, at least within the, the baby's gut from the very beginning, you know, from the first time that you can look for it, okay? And then what happens is wow. you 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 go from a, a situation where you've got a relatively sterile but poorly colonized, you know, very few bacteria through probably aerobic colonization to begin with, because those are the bacteria that are there to begin with. And then as they come along and facultative anaerobes start to change the gut luminal environment, you start to become more an anaerobic environment and the anaerobes come along next, okay? Your baby goes from breastfeeding or formula feeding or mixed feeding to eventually moving over to some solids and then away from milk-based feeds and into more complex solids and into a more normal diet. So all of that happens over that first period of life and then probably quite quickly. So by the age of three, you're supposed to have got to an adult type microbiome. So it's probably a lot quicker than maybe you would think. Fascinating. But if you, if you think about that backwards, most of the changes about your gut and your diet and your development around that side of things will have happened by the time you've got to about there you know there are other things like you know toddlers diarrhea describes a situation where babies or sorry toddlers young children can have kind of variable transit time through the gut so their gut can be faster or slower um they can be prone to constipation they can get toddlers diarrhea where you see sweet corn in their poo and and, and they have looser motions um so there are still things where the gut's definitely maturing but the microbi the microbiome is is thought to be adult type by the age of about three. But before that, there's a kind of gradient upwards in terms of your diversity and your changes. How important um, are the early years then in terms of your nutrition and exposure to antibiotics yeah, so, and such like? So those parts are probably fundamental. And there have been, again, we've talked about the issues of what we call confounding, which is when you associate something you know, forwards in time and you say, okay, this change here leads to this increase in risk factor here, but that could be something else that's come along that you've either not thought of or that's associated with that too. But people have described um, exposure to antibiotics in that first year of life as being a risk factor for subsequent IBD development, as an example. And, um, you know, the, the, the data has always been a little bit mixed about breastfeeding and about cesarean sections, which is quite interesting. And I suspect that's because there are so many other things at play by the time you get into adulthood that it gets diluted with time, you know. But it's certainly, if you want to set up your microbiome as well as possible, as a, you know, from an infant breastfeeding them, um, weaning them onto weaning them whilst breastfed onto uh, uh, complex foods, you know, uh, and trying to ensure that throughout that period you've got good exposure to fruits and vegetables and things uh, and avoiding antibiotics where possible but remembering antibiotics also save lives and, uh, you know and so we can't always avoid antibiotics it's not possible to do that um so yeah so that that's essentially the what happens in children um but the adult make, and then and then you go through life course from the age of three to probably into your elderly phase and in your elderly phase you probably have a, a reduction in your bacterial diversity again and you probably go into the kind of declining phase of your microbiome in that last phase of life so in the middle it's probably relatively consistent but it might be perturbed by big events like a course of antibiotics like that holiday to Tunisia that we talked about before yep. um so Holiday to Tunisia, buy them now. Um, so um, I have I've never been to Tunisia. Don't, don't take my I don't, pill. I don't know why that came out. I'm I've nothing against or for Tunisia. It just seems to be the place that fell out of my brain on this particular day. Um, but uh, or or a bacterial gastroenteritis or something, you know, might perturb that. So, I, I, but I do think it makes sense to treat children with childhood microbiomes if you can if you're able to do that. But I recognize that commercially that's very challenging. So difficult. You know? Um, because there's the elements of informed consent yeah. that you would require to take the donation. If the screening is in line with consensus guidelines for adults, there are multiple blood draws yeah. over 0, 30, 90, or however you, I think it's every 30 days in the consensus. Then there's the whole questionnaire piece and it depends on the age of the child are you really going to do a big questionnaire on a child yeah and if so what's important you're yeah gonna, you're not going to ask about sexual partners and so on and so on so you need a completely different set of criteria to what exists now and yeah how practical is it 
Well, so you've got you've got a compromise to make, haven't you? You either accept that children, if they're going to be treated by FMT products that come from adults, are going to get adult FMTs, okay? Or you accept that this is important enough that we need to go through that whole pre- process for children. And and I don't know that we really know the answer to that, yeah, you know? know. But I suppose I would, you know, uh, being an advocate for children and children's research, um, it is important that children don't just inherit whatever comes from adults by default, you know, because their physiology is different. Absolutely. The diseases that they have and the way that they get them is different, you know. There's a, there's an old maxim in paediatrics, which is children are not just small adults. And in a lot of ways they are, <laughs> but but in other ways they aren't. You know, we talked about the sort of neurological development of children, um, but the types of diseases that they get are very different. They're much more prone to acute infectious illnesses. Um, the kinds of cancers, for instance, they get are very different. Um, and uh, the infections they get with cancer are different too. It's different viruses that are at different levels. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think that as the CEO of a company that is getting really good at collecting poo yeah. from really screened people, I think that if the research or the science said for kids you need to collect stool samples from children, yeah, I think the industry would figure out how to make that happen. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I agree with I, you. I think they'd figure it out. But so I clearly I, that question: How do we get to that? I don't know. No, it's um, difficult, isn't it? Because you would have to, to actually prove a difference, you would have to be doing something in that sphere where you're taking paediatric FMT and giving it to children to, and proving that that's somehow better or different to right. adult FMT. But, you know, the, the, I, I'd be interested in your approach to smoking within FMT donors. Um, do, do you make that an exclusion criteria? Yeah, yeah. I do. So, so that... that you, there's ash in stool. Yeah. You can... I don't know what the analytical method is, but it is the case that there's ash and still yeah. and smokers. Now, on the UC thing, it's kind of interesting. We were always taught at medical school. It's protective. It's protective. Yeah. But with it comes all sorts of other yeah. very damaging effects. Yeah. Like increases your likelihood of basically every form of cancer. Yeah. And so we exclude for smokers. And I'll tell you something interesting. Um, in Spain and well, in Spain, the consensus guideline says you can't smoke non-smokers, but if you smoke less than five a day, it doesn't count. Then you're okay because that's the social smoking element. Okay. And I and I questioned the people who wrote the guidelines, yeah. and it's just a societal thing. I said yeah, less than five, everyone does that. So, but that's an example, I suppose. I would say where I would probably be anxious about putting a smoker's microbiome into a child over putting a non-smoker's microbiome into a child. For sure. Um, and why? And again, this comes back to that whole like, okay, am I being a scientist here? Or am I just being an irrational person who's having a hypothesis about something? But you know, we're probably starting to get an inkling that the microbiome is important in the development of various adult cancers somehow. Um, and sure. so what does that then mean if you're imparting that microbiome into a child 20 years, 30 years before they should have had exposure to those things, you know? Um, but equally, you could, just to play devil's advocate, you could say, we're only going to collect from people who are 80 years old and above yeah, and who've not had any disease because they're less likely to they, get... They've lived that they've long, lived that so long and they're healthy. That they're great, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But you wouldn't qualify... As per the the current BSG HIS joint consensus guidelines on donor criteria screening and all the rest of the FMT preparation application, because there's a cutoff, which I think is sixty years. Okay. And I always give a thought experiment, and I can give you it. Yeah. So you need FMT. You've got multiple recurrent C. difficile infection. Yeah. Coming back in every two weeks. Quality of life's down. Weight loss. And you have an option. You can take FMT number one or FMT number two. Now, FMT number one has been um, prepared using donor material from an 18-year-old just back to, just back from Ayanapa, uh, heavy booze, had an STI five months ago, treated with antibiotics, but longer than three months ago. Quite promiscuous. Uh, it's just yeah. It's very specific yeah, FMT quite, product. Quite, quite literature. Well, 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 quite, 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 quite. Does promis- that come on the leaflet? Well, quite promiscuous, but but still always always safe, um, and um, really bad diet. Okay, it's McDonald's. 
all the time. No harm to McDonald's. Deep fried Mars bars, Buckfast, that kind of thing. Number two is from a 90-year-old, super fit, lean, predominantly veggie, sometimes Mediterranean diet, never smoker, never drinker, looks like they're 50. Just bodies a temple. They look they look incredible. Which one would you rather have? I'll take the bank of mycin. <laughs> That's not allowed. <laughs> That's not an option, man. After all that. <laughs> oh man. Well, you can have your bank of mycin again then and get recurrence within a couple of weeks. But, but the point is yeah, I, I, I get the point. I I think point is one of the meets the guidelines. Age is irrelevant in that context. Um, you know, but I suppose right. the other question is let's say your 90 year old hasn't had colorectal cancer screening and she has a, a Duke's B carcinoma in her rectum. There we go. You know, but we do fit, te- we do fit uh, testing. Yeah. But I, so. you know, I, I, again, I'm, I, it's got to be careful to step out my own uh, realm of particular expertise, but I, I suppose the question is how, how sensitive is that to fully exclude, you know, and, you know, we could go around the houses about what makes a good donor and how you choose people and, and, you know, for sure but as a podcast the, episode the, is coming the reality is we don't know you know <laughs> and so a lot of these decisions we're trying to make good decisions based on what we do know and or or what we hypothesize and that is the more healthy you are as an individual the fewer diseases you have the, right. the fact you're non-smoker if you've got normal weight parameters etc those are probably good things um it makes sense yeah theoretically i mean i guess there's some argument to say and I've heard it from Professor Julian Marchese in mm. Imperio. We might be massively over excluding yeah. all these theoretical, potentially microbiome mediated things that whittle your donor pool down. Yeah. What's actually the evidence for that? Um, um, yeah. But going back a step, in IBD, there have been f- some cases of flares post FMT. Is that right? Yeah. But the majority, they don't get flares. Yeah. So what Which is, is interesting because what, you what would... is it about? The people that are getting the flares, do you think that's making them I mean, it might be nothing to do with it, I suppose, as well, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, you, 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 if you hypothesize, you would think, okay, we're giving, so we think IBD is predominantly microbial immediate disease, if we think that, and you're giving someone a big dose of different new microbes when we think that they're primed to respond to microbes. So it kind of makes sense that if you give people an FMT and it doesn't work, that it should lead to flare in some people, you know. Um, it's probably more surprising that it doesn't lead to flare in more people, you know. Um, and is that that's a real thing? I mean, you've got some experience yourself, haven't you? You've performed FMT. Like, what have you seen in your practice so far? So we, you know, I, I think when we do these studies, we always look at adverse events and serious adverse events and we collect data on that and all these trials do you know and you then compare what you see in one group with what you see in another group and I suppose what I would say is you're not seeing a really strong signal that FMT is way worse than giving a placebo for the emergence of these sort of adverse events and things like flare um there, there probably there may well be a, a small signal, but there's not a serious signal there, and uh, that in itself is quite interesting because, you know, you might hypothesize like you'd you'd see more, you know, um, but uh, again, you know, there's a first of all do no harm thing, which is uh, you don't want to give somebody a therapy that might make them worse, but I suppose if you weigh that up against the possibility of them getting much better, then maybe in some cases it's it's worth it. And I suppose that's a question for our patients that we need to take forward, isn't it? You know, we as we do better, bigger studies, we'll be, we'll be better able to define what the real risk of flare is and, and who we think, you know, which patients we think are risk, have a higher risk of that than other patients. Because right now we don't we, know that at all. I don't right? think we really know that at all. Yeah, I don't think we really know that at all. And that might, that might be, partly to do with what baseline therapies and stuff people are on. And again, across the studies that are published, there's a huge range of patient populations and therapeutic approaches. You know, some some of the studies allowed people who were on steroids and had them try to wean the steroids and some of them didn't want people on steroids, you know. Um, so on that point, do you see FMT or microbial therapeutics replacing the immune system dampening or like blocking therapies. So you've mentioned the steroids and then there's also the, yeah, the, yeah. the so antibodies. I, and 
I mean, that's that's the dream, you know? I, I would love to come back to you in 10 years' time um, and have this conversation again and say, uh, isn't it incredible what's happened? You know, uh, uh, all these drugs that I used to use. Oh, remember we used to use Infliximab, you know? And we're now getting someone with an IBD diagnosis and, and we're characterizing their microbiome and we're treating them very specifically tailored to them uh, with an intensive course of whatever it is. And then after four weeks, we're stepping down and we've we've fixed Humpty Dumpty. You Amazing. know, we've cured them and they go away and yeah, okay, they might come back in 18 months and need it again. But actually in between those times, we've not given them anything and they're just living their best life. Yeah, I mean, you can um, see me smiling. It's so you know, exciting. So it is exciting. exciting. Super exciting. It is exciting, you know? And uh, it might be possible, but we don't know that yet. And I suppose I am enough of an optimist that I want to pursue that until I'm sure that it's not possible, do you know? I would love nothing more than to throw away my prescription pad and never give another immuno immunomodulator, immunosuppressant to a child with IBD. But... Um, you know, go back to this pragmatic word. I also have people who've got a very significant condition that impacts on their life. You know, we have, I see um, semi-professional footballers who have stopped training because they've lost so much weight and energy and they're having diarrhea eight times a day with blood in their oh. stools, you know. So, so, so when it's so, at its worst, yeah. when it's at its worst, what, what's it like for these patients? Oh, I mean, the worst form of IBD is, is what we call acute severe colitis. Um, and, you know, we probably see about 10 patients a year who get admitted to a hospital with acute severe colitis in Glasgow. So that probably means there are about um, 20 across Scotland and probably about 200 in the paediatric population across the UK per year admitted with this, okay? Um, and I've done those numbers off the top of my head based on rough percentages of population. But um, in acute severe colitis, you have a really sick, swollen colon that, that is friable and bleeds easily and is not really functional in the way that it should be. So you have diarrhea probably eight to 10 times a day, including overnight, you have blood in all your stools, you have oh, severe abdominal God. pain, um, and you're very sick. And it, it it's, it's really impossible to function in any way in that state. So oh, yeah. these patients end up hospitalized and we give them intravenous steroids. And if that doesn't work, we give them intravenous infliximab and that usually works. And but what does in the what does the steroid and the infliximab do? Like, how does that work in the body? Yeah, so they're both immunosuppressants. So steroids are quite a broad immunosuppressant and have been used for a long, long time in inflammatory bowel disease. Infliximab is a is a newer, more modern uh, immunosuppressant called the biological, um, which targets a particular pro-inflammatory protein um, called tumor necrosis factor alpha. I don't know why it has that name, but that's what it's called. Right. Um, and it's been shown to to help reduce inflammation and heal the bowel and IBD. So between those two drugs, that helps most people get back into remission from acute severe colitis. But we still have some people in that situation who, who the drugs don't work for them and they need to have their colon removed. Um, as part of their management course, you know, so that's so kids and teens sometimes have still happens, yeah. to happen. Still happens. Yeah, we should all be working as hard as we can to make sure that doesn't happen at some point in time in the future. Yeah, you know, with all the new therapies uh, and diagnostics and 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 actually, interesting. So we're hypothesising about wh whether or not we could ever move away from those drugs. And that might be one indication where we can't move away from these drugs, you know, because you're talking about the sickest possible cohort of people who need that process switched off. And those drugs and are quick. very, yeah, quick, those quick. drugs are very effective at that and that their colon is in a dreadful state. So the prospect of going into that colon and filling that with bacteria right. to try and recolonize it right. without doing anything to address the inflammation um, that that might be the group where th they get worse or it, it, you know, it or, or worse, you yeah, know, or, worse than the IBD, you could get something else. Yeah, or they have sepsis or whatever, you know. So, so we've got to be careful about that along the way as well. And I think when we come back in 10 years, uh, probably will still be going episode, whatever, pro probably it is. episode 357. <laughs> um, w when we come back, uh, I think what we'll probably find is we're in a hybrid state where we have newer and better, more targeted drugs that we're using um, to try and achieve remission and to maintain remission. But we've also got more targeted microbial therapies uh, in our arsenal 
uh, and in some patients that might be enough um, but it might also be a part of their journey where we can use those sometimes to switch off disease flares um, and rely on drugs at other points. So I, I think it will be part of our arsenal and um, how, how and when we use them will be mixed up with drugs and you know our more severe groups will always need drugs. I think surgery will you know unfortunately still always remain a part of this journey for IBD patients. When the medical treatments um, when, just... Yeah. But um, but yeah, I, I think microbial therapeutics will grow and I suppose, you know, the, the huge optimist in me thinks that they will become a major part of, of treatment. I feel the same, of course, and that's part of the reason why we're doing these podcasts is to try and think about the future and also talk about what's coming to try and make that a reality, you know, the clinical studies and so yeah. on. I spent a very limited time as a doctor, but whenever I saw someone with IBD, I did say, look, I think there's quite a lot coming in the pipeline. Yeah. Some's in phase two. Um, one drug was like an antagonist for something called FIMH, which is, I think, what the adhesive invasive E. coli kind of uses to latch on to. Some people think that that's part of the pathogenesis mm -hmm. of Crohn's disease. There's other more complicated consortia, like eight, eight to ten different strains in phase two. And I also, f f of course, cited the FMT data, which is increasing all the time. Yep. And whilst I, I fully accept that, it's like impossible for you to implement it in your clinical practice now because, as we said, do you give 40? Do you give two? Yeah. Is it an enema? Is it a capsule? Is it so on and so on? But one would hope that within the next few years, we've drilled down even further, I think that the dietary manipulation as well, whilst that makes sense, does complicate matters quite a lot, doesn't it? It does, yeah. So what do we do about that? Because we spoke at the start about EEN yep. being like four out of five success. Like that sounds like a home run. It's yep. phenomenal. Yeah, it is. Yep. Does it get less effective over time or can you just keep putting people onto EEN? Maybe. Um, so, yes, it does. So if you actually look at the raw data, you know, you probably have a deteriorating efficacy from EEN each time you, you, you give it, okay? Um, but uh, we recently published a paper that looked at um, gluten immunogenic peptides in, um, in stools of people who had courses of um, nutritional therapy. And we found that, so that basically, if you have this protein, then it says that you're having some gluten in your diet and if you're on a course of EEN or if you're on, you know, our solid food based variant of EEN, which is CD treat, they're both gluten free. You shouldn't have gluten immunogenic peptide in your stool. So if you do, you're not doing exactly what you're telling us. Ah. Okay. And we identify Which I guess in some respects it's understandable. That's it's, human that's human tough. nature, right? It's a hard thing it's to really do. It's really tough. Think but, of all the things you can't eat that yeah, taste good. It's yeah. a lot, right? Yeah. It's a lot. But we we definitely saw an association between people who had this present and the success of their course. So I think what I'm interested in, I suppose, is if you do one if you're at your sickest and you've just presented with Crohn's disease and we give you this course, then you're gonna take it because you feel rubbish and we're telling you and you don't know any better because you've not hit Dr. Google yet or you've not got your own lived experience or you've not met other people who have the disease. And so you take it and you feel better and that's great and you comply with that. But the next time we ask you to do that, you you remember what it was like last time, you remember the birthday party you couldn't go to because you didn't want to, you know, not be able to eat the cake and how you felt. Right. And so maybe right. you're maybe you're less invested in it the second time. And by the time the third well, time comes around the fourth time, you're you're maybe fed up. Unless you're really motivated. So, and so, so what I've got I, written down is and you're maybe just about to get onto it, is which element of the EEN is driving the effect? So uh, what is it? Because I suppose if there was some small bit, like, yeah. for example, don't eat or drink foods that contain X, yeah. it would become easier for patients? Yeah. Or is so, it the physical solid elements? Uh, it's not solid. No, it's not no. to do with that. Um, so, you know, probably the most interesting parallel to think about is celiac disease. So in celiac disease, the body is uh, has an immunological reaction to gluten within the diet and when the gluten is in the diet the body reacts to that as if it's an invader and causes inflammation predominantly within the small bowel and the patient gets diarrhea and abdominal pain and they maybe lose weight and they don't do very well and as soon as you take gluten out of the diet that all switches off the bowel heals and you're and you're normal 
And as soon as you put gluten back in diet, it returns again. Is that a microbiome so, thing? So, no, it's not a microbiome no, thing. No, not everything's a microbiome thing. Not everything's no, a microbiome no. thing. Probably not a microbiome. <laughs> <laughs> but I bet someone studied it. For um, sure. Yeah, for sure. But so so in that context, it, the, the target is gluten. Take gluten protein out of the diet and you fixed celiac disease. Put it back in and your celiac comes back. Okay, so that's a pretty simple model if you, in a way of what a diet could look like. But when you start running that into practice, it becomes quite complicated because that's that's all, you know, that's all wheat, that's all pasta, that's most beer, you know. Um, so you're starting to pull things out of your diet and you see how challenging that is. But there are societies that will help you with that and you'll get dietetic advice and you might even get foods on prescription that have that are gluten free. So when you roll that into Crohn's disease and you think, OK, what's going on with this this diet? We know that this the liquid only diet works, as we said, in four out of five people. Um, we've started to understand how it works. Um, so again, my my, co- my friend and colleague Costas Garasimidis did uh, the the sort of key work on this, describing what happens to bacteria when you give a course of exclusive nutrition, and it and it seems to be a paradox. Instead of um, your bacteria, so your bacterial populations are already suppressed in Crohn's disease, you've got reduced bacterial diversity. And when you give exclusive nutrition, they're further suppressed. So you might think that they get better, but they get worse. If you plot them on a chart. The diversity element. Yeah. If you plot them on a chart uh, as what we call a principal components analysis, which takes all the microbiome data into an XY plot of, of, you know, the numbers don't actually mean anything, but but if you do the same test on the same group of people all the time, it'll plot in the same place. And so people who are similar plot next to each other, then you've got healthy volunteers over here and you've got your microbiome for Crohn's disease over here. They move away from healthy volunteers. So your microbiome gets more dysbiotic and gets uh, lower diversity, gets more suppressed. So, and yet your disease gets better. So there's a, there's a paradox there. And I, I think what exclusive ventral nutrition is, is a microbially suppressive therapy. And how I talk to my patients about it now, uh, really in the last few weeks, actually, I've kind of come to this, this way of describing it is the way it works is it feeds the human but it starves the bacteria okay so all the stuff that you need gets given to you and gets absorbed high up the gut but by the time it gets to the distal gut there's so little substrate left for the bacteria that there's nothing for them to do and so they they basically become somnolescent they go off to sleep and they stop causing the trouble that they've been causing and then your disease gets better wow and that's also reflected in the fact that when you've given a course of exclusive nutrition and you put people, that all just falls out as one big word, there's lots of syllables, uh, and you put people back on a normal diet, you start to see the inflammation switching back on again very quickly. And within two weeks, their calprotectin has risen back up again. Um, and then, you know, most people will have a disease flare back to where they started within a year if you don't do anything else wow. about it. So it's a very effective therapy, but it's, it's really specific. So, so how do we create a less socially restrictive microbial suppressing diet yeah so we've done that the team in Glasgow um, again my colleague Costas Geras some of this but also a chap called Vios Swalos who did a PhD developing this diet um, but but other colleagues as well within adult gastroenterology here and and pediatric gastroenterology and adult gastroenterology in Edinburgh so it's a very Scottish initiative we've developed a diet called uh, CD treat which is Crohn's disease treatment with eating. And it's a solid food diet that uh, has that basically is modelled on exclusive internal nutrition. So the idea behind CD Treat was if it's in exclusive internal nutrition, it can be in CD Treat. And if it's not, then it's not in CD Treat. So, but using real food. So for instance, we've already talked about how um, exclusive internal nutrition is gluten-free. So CD Treat is gluten-free. You know, when you're on exclusive internal nutrition, you don't take alcohol. So CD treats alcohol free, you know, so we we matched it as closely as possible for macronutrients and micronutrients, but using whole foods. And we we got um, philanthropic uh, funding from the Helmsley Trust, Helmsley Charitable Trust. And we've recently completed an open label study of the diet um, in children and adults with Crohn's disease. And it and it published. It, it, we're drafting a manuscript okay. as we speak. I wouldn't push you on it then. So, but but we're very encouraged. You can by the come results. back when it's published and tell me all about yeah. it. We're very encouraged by the results, and I suppose it, good. It, if CD sheet works, one is it gives you a, a version of this that's much more palatable. You can take a sandwich to work. You know, you can eat you can eat soup with your family. You know, you, you can sit down and eat a meal that's recognisable as solid food. So you maybe don't feel as socially excluded as you do on exclusive nutrition. But maybe more importantly than that. It then gives us a, a a baseline 
on which to develop. So suddenly you've got a testing platform. You can say, okay, CD treat plus gluten or CD treat plus, you know, whatever it is that we want to throw into that to say, and how does this change things? It's and like is it still effective? So it's like a reverse elimination diet. You're just adding stuff yeah. back into the platform yeah. and yeah. and seeing what happens. That's well, fascinating. What's the ultimate aim then with CD treat? Is it trying to get someone living as normally as possible without a flare, essentially? Um, so I suppose there's two facets to this. There's the therapeutic facet, which is can we give people dietary therapies that can drive their Crohn's into remission or maybe even control their Crohn's and stop it going into a flare in the first place um, that are livable and palatable and can, can fit into a normal life? Um, and, you know, that, that's certainly an exciting component of, of what we're doing with the CD Street program. Um, but the second question is actually, what does it tell us about disease biology? You know, and that comes back to what we talked about earlier about these binary questions, you know. So, you know, how do we predict responders against non-responders to this? And that's where the non-responders are not disappointing. You know, we, everybody would like to test something and have everybody 100% response and say, oh, this is great, look how wonderful it is. The, the reality is never that, but in that percentage, whoever they are that don't respond, they're, they're telling you something. You know, there's a signal there to find about They're just as what's important, different. perhaps. Yeah, easily just as important, if not more important, more because important. if we actually start to understand the disease signals about, I've given you a crude um, understanding about how dietary therapy might work in Crohn's disease by suppressing the microbiome, but what's it suppressing, you know? Is it just one bacterium or is it a consortium of bacteria? Can we identify the key players that might be important? Um, is your view that the key players are the same across all people with the disease or is it more like you lose a function or you gain yeah, some yeah. bad element because yeah. there's a lot of functional redundancy? I think, that, I think the latter. I think we're talking about a phenotype of bacteria and whether that is what they can do, you know, so we, again, we put forward this idea of, you mentioned adherent and invasive E. coli, you know, but um, Campylobacter seem to be uh, important in the Crohn's story as well, or people have associated Campylobacter concisus with Crohn's disease. Um, but it's a proteobacteria and it's also adherent and invasive. And so it might be that bacteria that have particular properties can exploit what's going on in the immune system in Crohn's disease and drive this disease process. Uh, and it, But it might not always be the same bacteria. It might be bacteria that have similar properties, you know. Going back to the, we touched on briefly the Amazon sort of higher diversity microbiome versus us and the differences in disease. Are there cases of IBD in like indigenous populations or are they just like, they just don't get it? Because I read that they don't get autoimmune disease in anywhere yeah. near the same incidence as like the Western population. I... I I don't know the figures. I, I I would be guessing, but you know, I I presume they probably do get it, or probably would get it, but probably at a much lower rate than we do. Um, what what is clear from the literature is that as you move to areas where IBD is endemic or or much more common, your risk starts to take up that of the population that you've moved to. You know, so that would suggest. Oh, really? That, yeah. So if you're an if you're an immigrant family that moved from one area to another that's got IBD, then you're more likely to get IBD. And then the wow. longer you stay there as a family, the higher that risk will go wow. until it eventually reaches that of the local population. And that supports the environmental yeah. hypothesis, so to yeah. speak. So we've spoken a lot about bacteria, but there's more to the microbiome than just the bacteria, right? Yeah. So what do you think is like the relative importance across the different microorganisms in the ecosystem? in terms of driving disease or being associated with health. You mentioned at some point that they were the most, they're the bacteria, the most abundant. So there's more of them than others or they're the easiest to culture? Like, Yeah, I, I think, I suppose, I, I think there have been more studies done in bacteria, uh, probably because the people applied the technology earlier to bacteria. Um, I suppose one of the weaknesses of the field is that there is no... Uh, and maybe you'll get a scientist on who'll tell you that this is wrong, but um, but you know, from my point of view, there's no unified approach to sampling the the back. We'll talk, call it bacterium, the fungome, and the virome. Okay, so they're probably the three major uh, constituents of the of the microbiome, and you can't currently 
throw one sample onto a machine and get all three of those out together as a unified data set. You can explore you can extract different each elements. of those distinctly, right. but trying to do that as a unified whole is currently beyond the, the, the abilities of science. Um, and I suppose that's where we get back to things like machine learning about trying to integrate those sorts of analyses is we should be paying as much attention to the virome and the fungome as we are to the bacterium. Um, and I think we're probably starting to, but I, I think that that's probably coming attractions is how do we start to think about the microbiome, not just as the bacteria, because that's convenient. It's the presence of the 16S gene that led us down that sphere, you know, Back to, uh, fungi have got an 18S gene that you can sequence as well that does a similar thing or a, an ITS gene which which can be used for a similar purpose but um, but those are obviously different PCR amplifications and then how you've processed your sample becomes important because fungi are much more robust and have stronger cell walls than bacteria so how do you you know make sure that you've captured all of those so there's, there's a lot of things that starts you know, the difference between DNA and RNA viruses and whether you can capture them all and how fragile that RNA is through this whole process. There's a lot of things that we need to think about to be able to look at all those different aspects of the microbiome, but it's going to be important. So it's and then, nuanced. And it's what about things like Helminth infection? You know, like people, Helminth colonization is, is prevalent within world human communities. We don't think about it too much in the West, but that's also officially part of your microbiome because it's a, a living organism that's within your ecosystem. <laughs> and are they, I mean, we exclude people with helminths in their gut. But what we're seeing is that in other parts of the world, yeah, it's just normal. It's just normal. It's probably normal for humans. So it's probably normal for humans to have helminths in their gut and H. pylori in their stomach and and. Over Ooh, a, the over, H. pylori is interesting. Over a hundred years, we've stopped that. That's interesting. You know? So the, the H. pylori piece then, <laughs> do you think we've just evolved? Is there some evolutionary advantage to H. pylori? Like, or it's just there and it's something we have to accept? Uh, so, uh, well, we've not accepted it. I suppose that's the thing. There was an editorial in The Lancet quite a long time ago in the 80s when H. pylori was kind of newly described, which said the only H. pylori is a the only good H. pylori is a, is a dead H. pylori. I think that was the title of the... And that was the kind of prevailing idea Wisdom about this time. organism was when we find it, it's always bad, get rid of it. And that's because when it was first described, it was associated with peptic ulcer disease and gastric cancer. And those are bad things. And so if you associate this with those, then you want to get rid of it. But was there a Nobel Prize with that as there well? There was indeed yeah, a Nobel, was Prize. A Nobel so Prize. Barry Marshall and Robin Warren. Um, Barry Marshall, who famously infected himself with H. pylori um, to, to prove... Not recommended. Uh, not recommended. No. <laughs> he did know the antibiotic sensitivities of the organism before he did that, and he did eradicate it from himself quite quickly. But he but he did self-infect. In, in Some a very, of these old school scientists. Yeah. They're just... So, um, bold. So, so, but H. pylori again, it's now it's now quite rare, and I would probably estimate that in 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 the UK we're probably less than one in twenty kids have probably got H. pylori now. It's hard to have exact data on that, but you know, I I take that data quite crudely from what the positivity rate of the tests for H. pylori were in the, in in our unit in Aberdeen when we were doing them, um, and it's not a population sample, but that's that's where I take that from, um. So it, it used to be much more prevalent than that. And it, there is now an association between, you know, H. pylori may be protective against other autoimmune conditions like IBD. Wow. Um, you know, so it, it might be that we've somehow changed our gut's immune response to this bacterial organism that used to live there all the time. And that one of the net effects of that is an increased risk of things like IBD. That's fascinating. So there's just still so much still to learn. And that's been one of the recurring themes over the course of this conversation. Hasn't it? It's like, I th yeah, I think so. We've learned a lot, but that should have still loads more. Um, Mark, how are we for time? Because sometimes time just flies. <laughs> I better go for my dinner. Yeah. Richard, thank you, man. No problem. That was awesome. Sometimes that just happens. So you put a date so, in the diary in 10 years. Yeah, yeah, 10 years. No. Well, when you publish some of your CD treat stuff, love to have you back on to talk about that. Yeah. You can show us the graphs and stuff like that. Sure, that would be nice. So interesting. 